Uh, um, my father was born in Mexico, and uh, when I was an infant or a toddler, he had decided to return to Mexico with, with his family uh, to help run a family business that his, uh, his father had established back in the 1930s or 40s. Um, so my family's had a connection with Mexico for, I think, about 70 years, and it had a pervasive influence in my life. Where's your mom from originally? Well, my mom is a different story. Uh, my mother was born as a displaced person uh, in Italy in 1940. Um, and she was displaced because her mother, her mother and grandmother, had been refugees from the Russian Revolution, Jewish refugees, who had then moved to Berlin, uh, where my grandmother went to high school. And then at some point in the 1930s, uh, they had left Berlin uh, um, for obvious reasons um, and gone to Italy, which at the time uh, was much friendlier, um, both legally and, and but really culturally, to Jews. It didn't, Mussolini didn't seem to share the, the really deep-seated, um, fascistic, anti-Semitic tendencies of Germany, although once his alliance with, with Hitler had been struck, anti-Semitic laws did, did begin to take effect. But it was, Italy was, was comparatively, um, outside of, say, Switzerland and Portugal, neutral company, uh, countries in World War II, um, Italy was probably one of the safer places for Jews to be um, during the, the Nazi era. So my mother had been born in Italy and uh, spent her childhood there. And then as a, as a girl, after the war, uh, had managed to obtain with her mother a visa to come to the U.S. So my mother then moved to the U.S., uh, where she uh, where she met my father, and, and that's how we came to uh, that's how I came to be, and, and eventually we came to be in Mexico. How long did you live in Mexico? Well, it depends how you count, because I, I guess I moved there when I was about one or two, and uh, um, really left just shy of my 14th birthday to boarding school, but continued living. I mean, my residence, I guess, was in Mexico until I was about 17 or 18 years old. So where did you get your interest in philosophy and philosophers? It, again, you know, a lot of my life has been by way of total serendipity. Um, when I went to college, um, I thought I wanted to be an anthropology major. Um, and then I actually took an anthropology course, and it was just dreadful. And I thought, oh, boy, you know, this isn't what, I mean, I kind of had this Indiana Jones idea of what, what anthropology was, but I really thought it was kind of grim and political and, and tedious. But um, th the University of Chicago insists on its students taking core courses. Um, and one of them was, one of the courses I took was called Classics of Western Political Thought or something to, 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 to that effect. Basically, the Western political and philosophic tradition. And you begin uh, you begin with Plato, um, the death of Socrates, the Republic, and you really you move through Aristotle, um, through uh, through the Middle Ages to the early Enlightenment, uh, Machiavelli, uh, um, Erasmus, uh, um, uh, you know Hobbes, the contract theorist Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, into the 19th century, and people like Hegel, Kant, Marx. I should go back, Adam Smith, of course, uh, too. Um, all the way up really to Nietzsche. And I'd really, it was an electrifying course for me. Uh, and so I'd, I thought I was going to be an anthropology major, and, uh, but I, I had this, I developed uh, this interest in, in political philosophy. And I was, I was looking at course offerings my sophomore year, and there was a course being offered just on the book of Genesis taught by Leon Cass. Uh, and I thought, well, this is in a way, this kind of marries um, these interests, because Genesis is ultimately about beginnings, but it's also about faith and, uh, um, and uh, um, human society and the development of human society and politics and all, this, all the kinds of things that take place in the book of Genesis. So I, I ap applied to be in the course, and uh, uh, Professor Cass accepted me. I, I have no idea why. Um, and that course was... You know, you, you kind of look back and you think of a few classes that really changed your life in some significant way. That, that was one of them. Um, and what really impressed me most is that in the hands of someone very smart, 
um, and thoughtful, like Leon Cass and like all the students uh, who were in that class at the University of Chicago, you could really take a text like Genesis, which you often think of as either kind of, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the fodder for Bible-thumping lunatics or, or for, or for um, uh, you know, historians of religion uh, who are looking for, you know, whether it, th it, this was written by, by J or Y or whatever that is, and actually say, you know something, this <coughs> book, even if you don't accept that the, that the world was created in, 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 in six days, this book actually has important things to say about um, who we are, what are the values that inform us, why we act in certain ways, what are the appropriate and inappropriate relations between husbands and wives, fathers and sons, fathers uh, and, and daughters. It's really an incredibly rich text. And if you just sit down and read it and read it again and read it again, we w read one book for the entire um, quarter. Uh, uh, um, you know, it's not a very long book. If you really give it some thought, you'll extract something rich and, and really sort of permanent and fundamental in it. And that was true not just of, of Genesis, but of a whole series of books. So I ended up be, um, uh, uh, focusing on a, um, uh, my, my major was called Fundamentals, um, which all my mates used to say, fun for mentals. I mean, there was kind of, we were sort of off in our own, in our own universe. Um, but what we did is we read certain books which were important, and we read them carefully. And, uh, and then we, we devised a kind of program around a question that we had. Uh, and that's what I did. And then uh, I ended up, I began with Genesis. I ended up reading a lot of Abraham Lincoln. But um, Abraham Lincoln isn't really, the teachings of Abraham Lincoln, I'd say, are, aren't really so far from those of Genesis or, Genesis, or the wisdom that informs Genesis is similar to the wisdom that informs Lincoln. Where would you put him on the list of presidents? I, number one, I'd say. And why? What's, what's behind that? Uh, well, I mean, for all the obvious reasons, school book reasons, saved the Union, emancipated uh, the slaves, but um, I think it's uh, fought the Civil War, chose to fight the Civil War, which is, which is something that I think is relevant to today because Douglas went to fought the Civil War. Um, uh, Buchanan didn't, wasn't going to fight the Civil War. It's more than that. Lincoln, of all our presidents, was, in a sense, um, a genuine, uh, had a genuinely philosophic cast of mind. And you see that in, in all of his speeches, beginning at a very early age. When he was in his, I think, late 20s or 30s, he gave a, a speech to the, to the Lyceum, a, a kind of school in Illinois. And you imagine, you have to imagine, sort of early 19th century, dusty uh, hinterland Illinois. Um, you know, very far from, from the metropolises of Boston, Philadelphia, New York, even farther from, uh, from London or, or Paris or Rome. But he gives a speech which is a reflection, it's sort of a, a, it's a reflection on political psychology. And the essence of it, and I'm really, again, it, I do it no justice, but the essence of it is the generation of America's founders found their psychological satisfaction um, in building something in creating a republic, what would their sons find, their children find, their psychological satisfaction in? Well, perhaps in destroying things. So the political problem becomes, how do you maintain, um, through the generations, um, people who will find their deepest sort of, their, their deepest political and psychological satisfactions in maintaining institutions rather than creating ones of their own. And that's a really serious um, political and philosophical problem. And it's one that really is, is, is something that goes back to, to other thinkers um, uh, before Lincoln. And, and it's incredible to see Lincoln talking about these issues in the 18, 18, I guess this would have been the 1830s, late 1830s, maybe late, early 1840s, and then developing as the crisis of the House divided um, unfolds all the way up to, to the Civil War. I mean, people cite Lincoln. They'll cite the Gettysburg Address or the uh, Second Inaugural Address or, or passages, the better angels of our nature from the First Inaugural, um, as evidence of Lincoln's rhetorical mastery and, and the kind of poetic sense that infuses his prose. But what is less appreciated, I think, is a kind of philosophical uh, mastery um, of, of the issues, of questions like, you know, is the statement all men are created equal 
um, something that was a, an artifact of its time and of that generation, or did it have, was it permanently true? Um, and could it survive and be defended when there were huge economic interests that defended slavery, as well as a kind of creeping cultural relativism that said, well, it's okay if, you know, not all people are really created equal and uh, 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 blacks are, are different, they're inferior, uh, you know, the, 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 the philosophical defense of the South that you get from John Calhoun all the way on to, uh, uh, all the way on to, uh, um, I guess, Robert E. Lee and, and Alexander Stevens and, and, and the rest of the Confederacy. Um, uh, you know, and, and that issue, in a sense, is really alive today. I mean, because if you're going to, you know, there is a, there is a sense um, very prevalent in the academy that cultures are relative and things which we find abhorrent, practices that we find abhorrent, um, are okay if they're practiced by other cultures with other value systems. Um, you know, now that, that cultural relativism tends to break down when you actually get into the nitty gritty of what s nasty practices other, uh, other cultures engage in. You know, female circumcision, are you okay with that? You know, um, uh, 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 the, the kind of rape culture in Pakistan, are you really okay with that? Is that just a kind of what Pakistanis can do um, burning widows in, uh, um, in, in, at least in 19th century India. Are you really okay with that? When you actually sort of, I think, press people who, who, who speak about cultural relativism on, on the specifics, they tend to get a little, uh, little queasy. But it's still out there. It's still, um, it's still a, a part of our, our, of our daily conversations. And you sort of look at what Lincoln was dealing with, different, different subjects, but really the same conversation. So if you move to today, how do you view what George Bush did in Iraq? <laughs> Look, I think um, that... Uh, and is it, how big a decision was it? In, you think it'll be in history? Well, what's, you know, I think there's this famous story that Mao or maybe uh, uh, Zhou Enlai had a conversation with either Nixon or Kissinger in which I'll say Nixon asked Mao what he thought the effects of the Cultural Revolution were, and uh, not the Cultural Revolution, of the French Revolution were, and Mao's reply was, it's too soon to tell. And that was, you know, 180 years after the date. So it's very hard from, you know, the standpoint of the present to make a final determination about the decision. But I do think that from this standpoint, it was the right decision. He needed to have done it not necessarily for the reasons that he gave, for the reasons that were understood, not invariably in the way that it was done, particularly after the initial invasion, but I think history would have judged him harshly if he hadn't done it. I think the Democrats would have judged him harshly if he hadn't done it, by the way. Um, and I think the same goes uh, in, in the looming crisis with Iran. Why do you think he decided to do it? I think, um, first of all, I think that there was a sincere belief that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And I think that if you sort of look at what people were saying before, the evidence that was available to everyone, the fact that President Clinton had acted against, uh, um, uh, in 1998, had, had launched missile strikes at Iraq against what he thought was a, were, was a WMD uh, um, capability, I think there was, first of all, the sincere conviction that Saddam had these things. Second of all, there was the belief that he was just the kind of guy who would who would use them. Thirdly, I do think that d the democracy agenda really did start to become much more relevant um, in the days after September 11th when you said, you know, you have, you have here conditions um, which create a culture and whether Saddam Hussein was or was not, and you know, apparently he was not uh, actually connected to uh, the bin Laden or the planners of, 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 of this attack. He was, in a sense, um, part of, you know, a kind of element, a symbol of this culture in which they swam. And, and someone needed to take a very big swing at that. Um, and also, I think that there was, there, was, there was this point, too, which is important today. Saddam had essentially been flouting the UN uh, for a dozen years. Um, he had been uh, evading sanctions, the sanctions, the the notion that you could have maintained a sanctions regime indefinitely, I don't think, is is plausible, um, and uh, and he was a kind of symbol. Of